Well, hello there, everyone, and welcome to our very extraordinary interview today with the one and only Joan London. My name is Hannah Olivas, and I am one of the CEO and co-founders of She Rises Studios. I'm so honored to be speaking with this incredible woman today. Joan is an award-winning journalist. She is an author and television host. She was the familiar face for many years, for millions of people who woke up to every morning, ABC's Good Morning America from 1980 to 1997. She has also authored eight books. She is a mom of seven children who really truly redefined the way for many women what it means to be a working mother, a breast cancer survivor and sought after speaker. She has won so many awards and just done so many things for women to be inspired by. And I'm so honored that you are here with me today. Welcome, Joan, and thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure, Hannah. So we are going to talk about resetting yourself. And what does that mean, especially into 2023? I feel like the world has gone through this extraordinary time, you know, since the pandemic hit, we've, we've done so, we've gone through so much globally, but I want to take it down and really focus today on women, inspiration, collaboration, all of those things. So I'm so excited to dive into this topic with you and, um, Gosh, I just, I, I, I got to get, I got, I'm a little nervous, you know, oh, just, um, no, 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 no. This <laughs> is just so nervous. Um, but I've been so looking forward to this for so long. So with this being a new year, um, to reset, they want to reinvent themselves, especially women who play so many roles. So what does it mean to re invent ourselves or women in general? And most of all, what does that mean to you? I think all of life is just a series of reinventing ourselves. And, you know, women might not even realize how many times they've reinvented themselves. But, you know, when they got out of college, when they were in the work world, maybe a few different jobs, they get married, they might leave the work world. I mean, so often women find that when their kids go off to college, it's like they say, wait a minute, what now? It's like, did you not see that train coming down the track? Like they've been in high school, they were about to go away. Um, you know, so sometimes it's just assessing life and not being smacked in the face by it. Um, understanding, you know, that your child's ages and how their needs for you change. Um, and not that, not that they necessarily get any easier as teenagers than when they were toddlers. I think they're more challenging these days as teenagers. But, um, you know, I think men, in my opinion, are trained from the outset in life to get out there and show yourself on the football field or the basketball court and show everybody how terrific you are and toot your own horn. And women aren't really raised like that. You know, we, we don't always have that... Um, starring role on a court or a field or somewhere to like express ourselves always. Uh, and so I think we have to learn it later in life and it's hard to learn. It's, it's hard to say, Hey, I have all these assets and I'm, I could really be good for your company because of blah, blah, blah. I don't feel like we're wired that way. I mean, I think we're just kind of wired as nurturers and to take care of other people. I mean, I remember after the show every day on good morning America, I would have done the show. I would have done all my post tapes after the show. I would have gone to my office and done whatever interviews I had to do for the day, done any magazine interviews. And then I go home so I could be there when the kids got home from school. Meanwhile, my male co-host is in the corner office with all the vice presidents and they're mm -hmm. doing like, you know, what, when, what was on the show today? What do we want to do tomorrow? And you're not in that room. If I had anything to do over again, I would say that I should have put myself in that room. In fact, I think I would have been at Good Morning America longer had I put myself in that room 
instead of trying to be the best mom and the best worker. Um, it's a very, it's a fine line for women to walk. It really is. Um, you know, I was kind of out there on the frontier of working women because um, I, ABC just really wanted to get me in that seat. And I just happened to be having a baby at the same time. So consequently, they gave me all these privileges to bring my baby to work while I was breastfeeding. This was at a time, Hannah, when you couldn't say the word breast right. on television. Mm -hmm. And it was so almost bizarre what I was doing. And, you know, the ripple effect was amazing. It changed um, company rules all across America for women. But it's not because I was out there as a flag, bra, bra waving, burn your bra feminist. I really wasn't at all. Um, I was just putting one foot in front of the other, you know, trying to do both things. Now it's become normal for women to be raising kids and taking care of a home and working. <laughs> and it's become normal and therefore we're supposed to be able to pull it all off, but it's not so easy. And I think that yeah. um, if you don't ask for help from your spouse, which we also tend not to really do, we would rather be martyrs and do it all of ours, all of ourselves, and then be overwhelmed and then be resentful. Um, I think women just have to like assess their lives these days. Otherwise you become totally overwhelmed and you have to look down the road and see what's coming. And like, am I about to enter a new chapter? And what could I be doing now to get ready for that? And that might be going back and getting retrained mm -hmm. in something. It might be, hey, before I got married, I worked in this industry or this industry. Those industries have changed a lot. Let me go back in and get myself up to speed, you know, because men don't have to take time off. They don't have to go out of the workforce for a couple of years. Um, and if not go out of it completely, just, you know, there's no getting around it. We are, our, our work world does slow down as we are raising little babies. Um, and then, you know, for me, once I left Good Morning America, I had to decide, I mean, I, I had to start redesigning my life and reassessing what am I going to do? And it's a hard question to ask yourself, but mm -hmm. I think that my advice would be um, to really ask yourself those hard questions of what do you enjoy doing? Like, I mean, some people are, enjoy like office work and these days you can get all kinds of virtual jobs doing numbers and office work or, or research um, or data collection. I mean, there's all, there's good and bad about everything being so virtual now. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do from home that you never could before. Um, and there's also the fact that a lot of people had jobs that they didn't go back to. We've never had people leave the workforce like has happened in the last year or two, which means that there are a lot of those jobs are open. So if you go on LinkedIn and you search a little bit, sometimes you can search jobs that might be open now that never would have been opened in the past. But I think the overriding advice I would give to women is don't sell yourself short. Hmm. Don't think that you can't do certain things. I have this motto in life. Whenever anyone asks if you can do something, just say yes, and then go figure out how to do it. But don't say no. And so many times women might see opportunities or hear about opportunities, and they think, wow, that sounds so cool. Like, what, for someone else? Why not for you? And if you don't know how to do that yet, say yes anyway. You can go on the internet and find out how to do anything these days. And the more you learn, the better you'll get, the more confident you'll get. But you have to kind of open yourself up to taking that little bit of a risk to enter into something and just, and I always say, if you don't know how to do it yet, fake it. <laughs> get until you figure it out. Um, but if you just like bring all your energies to something and, and be a good listener and a good question asker, um, I think that women would have a lot more opportunities open to them uh, mm -hmm. in today's world. But you have to kind of have a little bit of belief in yourself. And sometimes that that takes a little bit of suspended belief, but it's needed so that you have the confidence to like go into a, a, a new area. Uh, look, last year I was asked to um, to teach at Lehigh University. And. I immediately said yes. 
I'd never taught. I didn't know how to <laughs> design a lesson plan. I didn't know how to, I didn't know really anything about it. And I said yes. And I started using my imagination and figuring out what would that look like and putting together a class that would be interesting and unique. Um, I remember I told them, they said, do you want to cap the number of students? I said, no, because I come from television. The more people who are watching, the more successful you are. And they said, no, 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 right. no, no. You don't want 100 kids in your class. You don't want to be in the auditorium with 100 kids. That's 100 um, finals to grade. That's a 100 papers to grade. I was like, oh, yeah, maybe 30. <laughs> but I had no clue, Hannah, how to do what I was about to do. I mean, sometimes you make it up a little. And then as I was doing it, I was kind of getting a picture, a better picture of how I should interact with the class and how I could get more out of them. And it was like a fascinating year, a really hard work and a lot of work, uh, so much so that I didn't continue it this year. But but that's OK. I took it off my bucket list. Yeah. And it was and I did it partly also just for my brain. Like I'm 72 and I'm still very much involved in a million projects. And part of that is because I want to keep my cognitive uh, cognitive thinking. Yep. So I look for things. I take a hip hop class. I don't do it because I'm a dancer. I do it so that after they say, okay, now let's add on the fifth thing. And you're like, oh my God, what was the first, the second, the third, and the fourth? And like everybody's dancing, you're trying to keep up. I do it for my brain. And, you know, again, I'm not good at it, but I'm willing to risk going and kind of looking okay, if I can even say that. <laughs> I think first and foremost, you're extraordinary in so many ways. Um, number one, you don't look a day over fabulous. Um, I know your age because I did a lot of research on you. I am so, I have watched you on so many different interviews and just the talent that you have. I honestly feel like it's in your DNA. And some of the things that you're talking about, you know, being in that room um, with the guys versus going home and putting on that other hat as a mom. Yeah. Um, like you, you went through so many different things all at one time, but yet here you are. Now you're talking about you you were a teacher and you talk about doing hip hop classes. And so it kind of, you, you just kind of re-inspired me because I'm in my late forties and, um, I was almost an empty nester literally. And now I have this little 10 year old whom I'm raising, who she's extraordinary and I have grandkids and so I was ready to step into the next pivot of life and wasn't really sure what that was going to look like. I always make the joke, what, is it gonna, what am I going to do when I grow up? But yeah, the, I, I'd say that same thing. What do we, I mean, we can change. We can step into new things and say yes, because truth be told, five years ago, I would have never imagined sitting here with you today. And I would never have imagined writing books or doing the things that I do. So I think the message is so clear when you said, say yes. Oh, God. And yes. if you don't know, say it. And, and like you said, we are filled. We're so filled with knowledge everywhere you look. Anything you want to learn or do, yeah. you can do it. But you have to believe. You have to step out in faith a lot, which I'm sure you do all the time, yeah. um, which leads me to my next thing. And, you know, we, we created, and I'm going to be very open about this interview. We created all these different questions, but these interviews that we do are so conversational. Oh. Um, and and you, the best. I love that it is because that's when you really get to the nugget, but you talk about, um, you know, you were one of the first women, as you mentioned, to bring your baby to work. Yeah. So you in essence were this, what a lot of people look at as the have it all woman. Do you believe today that that is the case? Can women have it all? Can they have that life, work, career balance or what? what's the secret to that? That's a very loaded phrase. Um, I think we went through stages where, you know, women were expected just to stay at home. And then there were People like, you know, then there were the women that started going out into the workforce. Then there were the women at, in the 80s, like me, who said, 
okay, we want to be in the workforce, but we also want to be moms. And we also want to do all those things that we think we should do as moms, like breastfeeding. And, um, and, and, you know, as you go along these different stages, um, I think that in the eighties, there is this thought that we should be able to have it all. Like, why not? Why, why should, why shouldn't we be able to have it all? And I learned over time, you can't have it all, all the time at every moment. It's just not realistic. It's not possible. And so how do you strike that balance? I will tell you that I think part of it is structuring a good relationship with the company that you work for and your immediate bosses and maybe even your colleagues that that you are a working woman and that you are telling them that you're going to give them 150% to be really great at this job. However, you do have these little ankle biters. <laughs> mm -hmm. And therefore, there are going to be certain things that you're going to need to be there for them. I never missed a parent teacher conference. I never missed a recital. I never missed anything important in my a birthday party. I didn't miss those things because I said I was honest and with my boss about striking a, a reasonable compromise so that they would always feel like I wasn't just like, you know, leaving out and and not doing my job. And you all, it's not just your bosses, it's your colleagues. Mm -hmm. So you know that you have to take a child to a doctor's appointment and you know that you have a, a meeting with everybody in the office. My advice is to pull one person aside some, one friend in the office and say, I'm going to have to either not be there or walk out. Um, will you just keep some notes for me? And then, you know, say to the rest of the office, I've got an appointment that I've got to go to. Not I've got to take my child to a doctor's appointment. Not I have to go to my child's school. Because a lot of them, they're not parents or they're men, so they don't have to worry about these things. And then they resent, oh, like she's being allowed to go off and miss this meeting and miss that and this. You don't want to create that kind of an atmosphere in your workplace. So I think it's incumbent upon us as women to not like, I don't know, like flaunt it in the faces of other employees. Mm. Um, and you can be all proud that you're the mom and you're not missing that parent teacher conference and you're leaving the office. But let that pride just stay with you. Don't push it around the office because meanwhile, they're still at the office and they're still working on that project. And that's like a mentality that I think is important for women to understand. Mm -hmm. um, if we're all, if we're, we're all doing this now and we're all, so we have to figure out how can we do it harmoniously with our colleagues and with our bosses. So that's my advice. Let them know that you're going to, that you have these certain dates that you're going to have to be gone but man, that is not going to affect the job that you're going to be doing for them. Try to put yourself in those meetings with all the guys. And, and oh, and don't stay in your office. This is a big one. The men, meanwhile, are out saying, hey, I want that project. Give me that assignment. Yeah, I'll take that, which, of course, is going to lead to them getting, you know, elevated. And meanwhile, women so often hide out in their office because they're they're just wired to stay there and be task efficient like let's get everything on that to-do list done because that's the way we live our lives you kind of have to mm -hmm. get outside your comfort zone and go out and walk into that boss's office and say i've been looking at this i think that i have an idea i think if we did this blah 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 blah, blah it could be really good for the company that's what the guys are doing and we can do it too. We're just as imaginative. We're just as creative. It's just that our brain is filled. We are. Our, our brain is just filled with our to-do list from our family life and cooking dinner and grocery shopping and taking kid, making sure the kids have the right cleats for soccer and all this other stuff that it is a little harder sometimes for us to be that imaginative, creative one at work, but but sometimes we can make our jobs more interesting if we can somehow get past that 
and take a little risk, gets out our, outside our comfort zone and be a little more trusting in ourselves and have that self-confidence. And again, if you don't feel it, fake it. But walk into that room, walk into that business meeting, walk into that office of your boss with oh. a sensibility that you own your knowledge and your ability and your creativity and that you have as much to offer as the next guy. Absolutely. I feel like that was mic drop right there. <laughs> we, we, um, you know, we go through so many different things as, as the mom, the wife, the sister, the grandmother, the, there's so many elements. And then of course, us wanting to have our own careers or businesses, it's, it's, I always, I describe it as a woman standing on one leg, juggling fruit with a teeny tiny bowl and just handling it all at one time yeah. uh, and smiling, even though behind the scenes, sometimes on the inside, we're just literally shaking yeah. in our shoes, but having to really step out there and just say, you know what? I can do this. I am worthy. I can own this. I have the power to step up and step forward, period. Yeah. So I'm, I love what you're saying. And especially for when you talked about like what you do, how do you mentally prepare yourself? An example for one of the biggest interviews or people that you have dealt with, how do you mentally prepare yourself for something like that? I'm, um, I'm a good student. Any tips on that? I'm a good student. I am... Um... I'm a homework junkie. Whenever I get, for instance, booked on a speech, I, these days, we never had Google when I was on Good Morning America. We didn't have, we couldn't go and just ask any question and find out any answer. They sent us reams of paper to read at night about who we were going to interview the next day. But Today, we live in a different world. And by the way, if you're going to go pitch yourself to a company, go online. You can find out everything about that company. You can find out everything about the person mm -hmm. that you're about to step in a room with and, and be interviewed by. But I'm a, a homework queen. I come well prepared to everything I do. If I'm going to do a speech for, I just did one two months ago for a, a cancer center and for their foundation. And I went online and I Googled it and I found out what do they, what do they spend their funds for? How are they? Like I knew all about it. So I could craft a speech that really resonated with that audience. Um, I hosted the um, National Institute of Health Foundation award ceremony last month in Washington. So, you know, I went on and I, I really researched all these scientists for, that were going to get these awards for having come up with these amazing discoveries with monies that had been provided for them by the NIH, the National Institute of Health. So when I walk in, I mean, sometimes I hear afterwards, like, that was amazing. Like, you seem like you just knew so, so much because I would add little things into my introduction of these scientists because I knew all about them because I put the time in. You just have to sometimes, I mean, I love research, so it's easy for me to sit here and say this. Um, you know, you sent me a list of, I don't know, eight or 10 questions, not necessarily the ones we're doing right now, which is fine. But what do I do with those 10 questions? As soon as I got them, I, as soon as I had a little period of time that I wasn't doing something, I opened up my laptop and I thought about each question and I answered them like, like three, four paragraphs. And then right before this interview, mm -hmm. what do I do? I read it over. So if you ask me any of those questions, I'll have already thought it through. You know, one thing I learned doing live television for 20 years is that you don't want to go into a live interview like a fishing expedition and just, you know, drop the hook in the water and hope something good comes up. We had writers who, yes. who spoke to these interviewees beforehand, and they would provide us then with their notes from their pre-interviews and all of the you know research about the person or the event or the movie or whatever it was we were doing the interview for. And quite often, I remember one time a writer called me and she was like reading me the questions and answers. And I said, I have the interview. It's already been dropped off at my house. I don't need you to 
to to read off the questions to me. I need you to tell me what not to ask. Mm. Because you already know what questions you ask where the person went off on a tangent, uh, you know, just went on forever and ever or got real religious and in their, their answer. And you're supposed to be, you know, I mean, I was on the air back in a day where David Hartman and me and later Charlie Gibson and me prided ourselves that whenever we did an interview at the end of it, you wouldn't know whether we were Republican or Democrat or Catholic or Jewish or that we had a, a, a solid opinion on the women's movement or anything else. That was not our job. Our job was to elicit the opinions of the people that we had on our show. It's changed. I mean, we're, we're living in a world of opinion television. And it's, you know, I don't have to tell you, I don't think it's sitting so well with the American public. Right. Um, it's just very different today. But back then, it was my job to learn as much as I could and this, there's a lesson here. Learn as much as I could about that person I was going to have to be talking to the next day. You can do the same thing if you're going to have to do an interview with a, you know, a, a possible boss. Or if you're going to have to walk into a, a, a conference room and deliver a, a, you know, some kind of a presentation. Or stand up at a PTA meeting and have something relevant to say. It just takes going the extra nine yards ahead of time and doing a little research so that when I don't ever start an interview ever not feeling confident about being an, able to either answer the questions if I'm being interviewed. But these days I do tons of interviews because I do them for the American Heart Association. Mm -hmm. I do them for prevention magazine webinars. I do them for many, many, many different organizations. So I'm always doing these webinars, hosting webinars, interviewing people all the time. Everybody, sometimes people meet me and they say, how are you enjoying retirement? My husband always says, just say yes. Just say you're enjoying retirement. Don't try to tell them about the 20 projects that you're working on. And I don't enter any of those webinars not truly understanding who the people are that I'm going to be talking to and what the issues are that we're going to be talking about. I walk in unbelievably prepared. And that's how I've garnered the success that I've garnered. And, and you've done it so well. Uh, just hearing you speak, it's, it's just, it's incredible. It really is. You, um, you just continue to amaze me and, and oh, gosh, I wish there were so many people that were here today that could see and hear this interview happening um, you would just, I'm telling you, it's, there's people that just are amazed by you on a regular basis. Um, you mentioned, and I wasn't really going to talk too much on this, but I feel like you can shed some light, um, on, uh, especially for women. So we are in new times. There are so many different things that didn't exist back in the eighties and nineties versus now, Specifically, you know, we're going through this time of chronic illness. I see women all the time being diagnosed with chronic illnesses, cancer, all these different things. I went through it. I am going through it. And a message that I've always wanted to share, and when I became public with my story, was I didn't want women, anyone to give up after being told, you have cancer the prognosis is this. And of course I had pity parties, lots of them. The why me, how do I get through this? What am I going to do? I'm a mom. I'm a grandmother. Um, I'm married. I still have so much to do. I went through the whole thing. Um, and I, and being very honest, I sought help. I had to ask to, I need to talk to somebody. Yeah. And so you brought that up earlier when you said, ask for help, yeah. ask for help. You've been so open about your own journey with cancer and you helped so many women. And, and believe me when I tell you, you have to really be strong and hang on and lean into others when we're at our sometimes weakest moments in life. So I feel like that's so incredible what you've done, what you've shared. But here we are in 2023 and we're in this pandemic and now all these other issues are almost being pushed back. Yeah. The pandemic is at the forefront. Yes. And Hannah, unfortunately, so many women didn't go 
for testing. Yes. Um, so for their, you know, um, mammograms and my cancer uh, surgeon, when I went in for my, my annual checkup, I'm eight years out and I had triple negatives. So if you're, you know, yes, I was bald for a year and it was tough, but um, because of it being triple negative, I now don't have any lingering, anything lingering on. I don't have to take medications or anything. Uh, I have girlfriends who ended up um, having to take all kinds of medications the rest of their life, which are problematic for them. Um, we live in an amazing time right now, quite frankly, an amazing time when it comes to cancer. Mm -hmm. um, we have had more discoveries, important discoveries for cancer treatment and eventually cancer cure in the last five, 10 years than we've had in the last 50 years. It's been, the, it's it, the, first of all, um, some of the big money uh, has been dealt out in a way like they would go to um, the four big uh, cancer institutions like in the Boston area. And they'd say, we're going to, because there was always this competition for funds and it made everybody do their research in a silo and not share it with anybody else. Mm -hmm. And we weren't advancing cancer research at a fast enough rate doing it that way. But then as big money institutions from the National Institute of Health to BCRF that would say, we're going to give you funds, but you have to share your information. And by doing that, and that started about 10 years ago, it really got underway about eight or nine years ago. Consequently, by everyone in all these different research um, facilities around the world, not just around the United States, around the world, that are all doing research. And instead of doing it independently in a little silo, now that they're all pooling that research together, the discoveries have become exponential and at like rocket speed. And we are living in a time right now. I remember when I used to have these conversations with BCRF because, um, I mean, Leonard Lauder was wonderful. He called me within days of, of being diagnosed. And his wife um, is the one who started B Breast Cancer Research Foundation. And he got me involved. And they give out a $250,000 grant every year in my name. So, and I go, and so what do you think I do, Hannah? Of course I say, so who are you planning on giving it to? I fly to Texas to go find out what they're doing in that lab and understanding it and then coming back and saying, okay, I, I like that lab. They're doing things. And I wanted things, I wanted to be associated with things that were going to advance the treatment of um, metastatic patients, because I said, they're the ones that are on the, that are like hanging on. They need the medication. If we can figure out how to keep metastatic cancer patients alive, and they said, you are absolutely right. You're absolutely right. We have to stop just looking at these different types of breast cancer. And we need to figure out how to make breast cancer a chronic illness. They figured it out with AIDS. It was a fatal illness. And then through all this research, they figured out how to make it a chronic illness that you live with with medication the rest of your life. And we're getting there with with cancer and with breast cancer specifically. I mean, the medications that have come down the pike for women with metastatic cancer and consequently other, like mm -hmm. up in, up in um, uh, Boston at the Dana-Farber Institute, I remember mm -hmm. eight years ago going there and um, to interview, <laughs> I mean, not to be treated, but to interview. And they said, we're studying triple negative right now. Triple negative is this, it's not like one of the other three breast cancers. It's this other cancer, cancer that's almost like an, what they call an interval cancer. It could have happened anywhere in your body. Right. It just happened to occur in your breast. And they said, we're going to know in a few years how to treat. Um, mm -hmm. And they said, we're already finding out that triple negative is actually about eight different kinds of breast cancer. We now know, here we are eight years later, we now know that there are the, all these different buckets of triple mm -hmm. negative and they're finding treatments to treat each one of those specific different kinds of triple negative. 
They've also come out with the way that when you're um, diagnosed, that they can test your tumor mm. and find out which medication is going to really work and which one won't work. And before we had that ability, they would just, I'm one of them, they just doused me with as much chemo as they possibly could without killing me. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically what you go through in the kind of chemo treatment that I went through. And I think that 10 years from now, just like we say now, wait, they used to put leeches on people to, to <laughs> stop yeah. disease. They're going to say 10 years from now, wait, they used to douse people. They used to douse women with enough chemo to almost kill them, not, not quite, in order to kill that tumor. And they're going to be aghast at that. Because, you know, I say in a lot of my speeches when I go to big cancer organizations, we need to get to the point where we only give a woman the amount of cancer, only enough to actually kill the tumor, mm -hmm. not the amount yeah. that is tolerated. Right. In the past, we gave as much as would be tolerated without totally taking away your immune system. I mean, I had to have two blood transfusions during my treatment because my, my white blood cell count got down so low. And a lot of that kind of toxic chemo has an afterlife in your body. Some of that chemo will be in my body until the day I die. And so we've got to get, so now they're figuring out how to get past that mm -hmm. and how to create new kinds of treatments that won't do that to you, that won't stay in your body forever. And now we also have that testing where we can find out, don't give her a ton of Taxol if Taxol is not what's going to treat her tumor. Give her some other kind of treatment. So we've kind of gotten away from that standard of care. And we were stuck in that rut, boy, for a few decades where every woman that came in and got diagnosed with breast cancer got the same exact treatment. When we know really well that no breast cancer is alike. No person's... Very they're totally different inside each individual and you need to have personalized treatment and we're there now. So I will just say to everybody out there, if you're dealing with cancer or you're, you're diagnosed within the next coming year, you have a friend, just know that you couldn't be living in a better time than right now. The, there's so much hope right now because of the multitude of answers to research questions and new treatments that are coming up. And we we may see a cure to cancer in our lifetime. I mean, Hannah, you might, I don't know about me, but I think you may see, um, we're, we're coming to it. We're gonna get there, I think. I, I believe that we are. And I wanna thank you for, for sharing that part of your journey. I know that wasn't in what we discussed. But I felt like it was something that women needed to hear that there is yeah. hope. We are, we're, you're not alone. Um, yeah. There is so much incredible research going on. I'm, I'm getting ready to yeah. go into clinical trials. So I know what you're talking uh, about. Um, you healing energy. Thank you. So elements. it's just, uh, it's, it's a part of life. No one is exempt from certain things that happen in life. It's yeah. what we do with it. Um, I always say, you know, there in the mess, there's a message and that's what I hang on to, uh, on a personal note for me anyway. So let's talk about, you know, when we talk about reinvention, we talk about what 2023 has, um, so many people wait for new year's resolutions. I'm not one. I'll, I'll be truthfully honest. I'm not a resolution fanatic. Me either. I, believe, I believe reinvention can happen at the moment you decide I'm ready to do something different. But what I do want to know from you is where would you like to see more women show up in 2023? An example, entrepreneurship, um, an example, what I shared with you, Wall Street, finance. Where would you like to see women show up in 2023? Government, particularly policymaking. Yeah. Um, we need people, we need women in organizations that um, uh, have a hand in creating policy, uh, lobbyists getting into senators and congressmen and women, 
Um, I've been to Washington. I've gone in there to uh, fight for mandatory mammogram reporting. When I was going, we couldn't even get all the women senators to sign on to the bill. And it had no financial component. Now, granted, I mean, anybody with a brain knows that if you if you make mandatory mammogram reporting that's going to say, oh, you need an ancillary test. The insurance companies know enough to say, oh, wait, then that means we're going to have to pay for them. Let's fight this. Yes. But we just kept fighting and fighting. And, and finally, they got that bill passed. Unfortunately, it didn't have a, a deadline for the FDA to rewrite. Uh, so it's still sitting in the FDA. And we need the FDA to rewrite the national prescriptive. Otherwise, we're still at that point where you might live in a state where they have to tell you when you go for your mammogram, whether you have dense breast tissue and you need another test because a mammogram is good, but it can't see cancer if the whole thing is white. You know, yeah. and if you have dense breast tissue, the whole mammogram looks white. And as I've been told, it's like looking for a, a snowball in the middle of a snowstorm. Yes. And if I hadn't had an ancillary test that day, when I went for my, and I didn't have just a regular mammogram that day, I had a 3D mammogram clear. Then I walked across the hall and I had an ultrasound and found out that I had stage two triple negative breast cancer. So women need to have that knowledge. But right now we're still operating on state by state. And, you know, you can Google and go online and find out what the laws are in your state. Um, I just got through um, last year testifying before the Connecticut state legislature. Connecticut was the first state and I live in Greenwich, Connecticut, it was the first state to pass mandatory mammogram reporting laws so that um, radiology labs had to let the woman know whether she needed another test. Mm -hmm. And then I went back and I, uh, I testified before the committees uh, that were going to approve the law that said the insurance companies had to pay for that test. And it finally passed here in Connecticut. But again, we're still doing it state by state. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, women are dying and of cancer and they're not getting the other tests that they need. And it's also foolish because if you find a woman's cancer early on, the treatment for it will be far less. The cost to the insurance company will be far less. And the prognosis and, and how long that, that woman's life will last will be much better. It'll be much better prognosis. It makes no sense to not pay for the test to catch the cancer so that you don't find out until you're like stage four and then you're dealing with metastasized cancer. It makes no sense. So I would like to see more women. We don't have enough female gynecologists. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough female gynecological surgeons. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough female urologists. We don't have enough female radiologists. We don't have enough um, females in different parts of the government that are thinking about what women are dealing with. I testified before the House Ways and Means Committee a couple of years ago, trying to get them to pass the Family and Medical Leave Act. And I was saying, look, women leave the workforce, not just even to have babies, but yeah. to take care of aging parents. And they shouldn't be have to lose their job. They should still be compensated they're actually doing the job of some caregiver at some institution in some senior care facility. They're doing that job. Like they should be compensated. I mean, that bill is little parts of it have gotten passed, but you know, we as women, there's so many things we need to get out there and fight for. Um, just look online, just see, I mean, you know, look at just watch coverage of what they're doing in Congress and say, Oh my God, I need to fight for that. I need to be, I need to do my part as a woman. There's so many things. And yes, certainly in the banking industry, um, if there were more women in the banks when you walked in and you were trying to get your business idea set and funded or get an extra loan for your house because you needed to do something to, to add on so that you could have aging parents come and move in, any of those things. I mean, it's almost anything you can think of, Hannah. That if, if there are females, people, if there are women in the room, decisions might very well be made in a different way. 
I, I couldn't agree with you more. And when I asked that question to you, I saw the passion come out. <laughs> who, every woman who is watching this, you're hearing this, they, that we are, you know, in need for so many different aspects yeah. and so many different reasons. And it's, it, government is huge. I even saw, and I have no political degree background or anything. Um, I, I ran for assemblywoman in, in Las Vegas for Nevada. And um, because I wanted to see specifically healthcare change for Nevadans, unfortunately, the, the diagnosis kind of kicked me out. But oh, it, it really, I felt like people needed to hear from a patient's yeah. perspective, not politically, but from a patient's personal perspective of, hey, not every generic brand works for everyone. It's like yeah. you said earlier, not every cancer patient's symptoms or diagnosis or case is even the same. So I'm hoping that women who have the interest in stepping in, into uh, government, I, I'm, I'm hoping this was like the light bulb that clicked on for them because we need you for so many reasons. Um, and so and many other ways, Hannah, not just as, you know, anything grandiose as a politician or right. run office. We need, if you've been an unbelievable mom and taking yeah. care of your kids, think, and now your kids are gone. Think about being a, um, a traveling caregiver for aging. We're in desperate need. Mm -hmm. The aging population is exploding just because the whole boomer generation, 10,000 people turn 65 every single day in this country. And there's a huge need and it's going to grow and grow and grow exponentially for caregivers of aging people who want to stay in their homes. Yes. Yes, there is. I, we are caregivers to my father-in-law. It is so true. It, yeah. it, it, it really is. I feel like you described uh, so many different things that, that almost anyone and everyone can relate to. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. And I really feel like you just inspired, again, the uh, masses. So, you know, over the past few weeks, you have heard and been described as a trailblazer, as this woman who's broken barriers with a very, very dear friend and colleague of yours, Barbara Walters. And I do want to offer you our sincerest condolences. She was another extraordinary force. She was. <laughs> for so many reasons. I you know something, Hannah. She was not only an extraordinary force in um, in her profession in journalism, and she didn't just help women. She raised the bar for all of journalism. Mm -hmm. She showed men and women both how you go the extra mile to get that interview. How you, I mean, she talk about preparing. Like her preparing for interviews was so off the charts. I mean, she would prepare and go over hundreds of questions for weeks at a time, trying to cull down and get to the best things. She went in so prepared and therefore she went in so confident that she had the balls to ask questions that everybody really wanted her to ask. You know, maybe other people thought, how dare she ask that question? She asked it because she knew the audience wanted that question asked. And she dared to ask it. She risked her her position in a, in her in her um, career to ask those questions, and she would get slammed sometimes for doing it. But while she raised the bar in the industry and taught men as well as women how to go the extra mile, when it came to women, let me just tell you, I don't know if it even came out to the degree that it should and could have come out to what a mentor she was, mm. how she helped other women. She was the first time I met her, she was on the show and I was brand new as a co-host of GMA. And I got assigned to interview her about interview her about one of her specials. I don't remember who was on the special, but I remember she took me aside and she said, I'm going to help you. I want you to know you can't fight for equal equality around here it is mm -hmm. not that time is not here yet not just in television in the world in society 
And if you fight for equal time, you will be exactly where your predecessors are, out the door. Mm -hmm. What you're going to do is you're going to take every small assignment that they are willing to give you, and you are going to make it shine. You're going to make it memorable. And all of those jewels are going to add up, and they're going to realize how good you are. And that's how you're going to make your way up to the top. You're also, if you follow my advice, you're going to write thank you notes. She said, how do you think I get all the interviews that I get? Wow. It's because when, an, it, when it comes out in variety that, you know, Richard Burton or, or uh, Elizabeth Taylor, or whoever it is, just got cast in a movie or mm -hmm. cast into a Broadway show, I send them a, a handwritten note right away. And I say, ah, oh, this is great news. You're going to be perfect for this role. I hope the production goes well. I can't wait to see the you know, finished product. I look forward to talking to you about it when it's all said and done. I can't wait. And then when the movie comes out, who do you think they call Her. to do the interview? She yeah. said, it's because I've put the groundwork in. She said, I've called them. I've I've gone and made relationships. I've, I've made a lunch appointment with Paul Newman, to, not to get anything out of it, just to have a lunch and talk about the industry because mm -hmm. I, built, I built relationships. So when he had a movie come out, who do you think he would call? Because he had a relationship with someone and therefore he had a trust in that I, in, in doing the interview with me. And she said, so, Every time you somehow accidentally get a great interview with some big celebrity, write a thank you note. So here's what happened. Sometime after that, Richard Burton got cast into a Broadway show, um, Equus. And David, I, it was David Hartman that was I was with at the time. Those were the first 10 years I was with David, the second 10 years I was with Charlie. He was gone. And so... Somehow they decided to give me the interview because David wasn't there. So I did this interview, super got prepared for it and did the best interview I could possibly think about doing. And afterwards, I said an, an thank you note, just like Barbara had told me to do. Cut. Year later, Richard Burton is starring in a movie. I don't even remember the, what the movie was. And in the meeting, which of course David would be at those meetings. I was home taking care of my baby. Mm -hmm. He was in that meeting and they said, all right, so Richard Burton's going to be on. And David's like, oh, I know Richard Burton. And they said, actually, he asked for Joan. Yes. He was like, he was like what? <laughs> and like he asked for her. So we need to give her the interview because it's a request from Richard Burton. And he was like, I don't get this. I'm telling you, it's because I wrote that thank you note. Yeah. And, so, and Barbara continued to do that with me all throughout my career. And when she would do an interview and there would be a room full of people, writers, producers, interns, camera people, and some of them would be, she would write, I'm not lying to you. She would write a thank you note to everyone who was in that room. Yeah. So interns, Interns who thought, she doesn't know who I am. I'm just here, an intern here at Good Morning America. I mean, well, at ABC. She, they would get an, a thank you note from her. And, and she would say to them, if you need my consult, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And so mm -hmm. she constantly mentored. I mean, went way out of her way and took a lot of her time and attention to mentor all the young female producers and writers and, and, and interns and people in the office. You can talk to almost anyone who worked at Good Morning America during the time that she would, was there. And she was always our first call. If David was gone and then if Charlie was gone, we always called Barbara. If she was off somewhere and couldn't do it, someone else would come in. But usually Barbara would come in and work with me. And, um, and I'm just surprised at all the people... I've been hearing from personally, from GMA and from ABC News in general that have said, we've been hearing you talk about how much Barbara mentored you. I just want you to know she mentored me too. And I was a lowly intern at the time, but I became a writer and then I became a producer and she helped me all the way along. So she, I think we should all be inspired by 
what she did because she went the extra nine yards. Yes. And, and if we can kind of make that our goal, when we attain any level of success in whatever industry we're in, each and every one of us as women, if we could help the next person take the time out, go to the person who's like, you know, down the food chain a bit, down the success ladder, ladder a bit, and let her ask you questions and, and give her some advice, kind of like some of the advice I've been giving today, you know, help that next person. Because I always find that if you help others, you help yourself. That's kind of just a truth. It is. It's, it's paying it forward. Yeah. Can you tell me, I just have to know, what was one of your most favorite times with Barbara? Or just one of your most incredible memories of her? If I, and I know that's a loaded question, but there has to be something that just totally sticks out to you in addition to what you just shared. Well, a lot of it is just the woman to woman conversations we had during commercial breaks and us talking about she, her biggest regret was not being with her daughter, Jackie, more, more often when she was a, a young kid because Barbara was just so entrenched in her focus. But I'm going to tell you one this because it just sticks out of my mind. So Barbara came in because whoever, Charlie or David was gone. And we happened to have Kermit. It would have been David because my little girl, Jamie, was about five years old. So it would have been 1985 and Kermit the Frog was going to be on. So, of course, I said to Jamie, Kermit the Frog is going to be on the show tomorrow. Want to come into the studio? And I would do that every now and then whenever I thought that there was somebody that they would like, mainly if Jack Hanna was bringing on a, a silver tiger or, or, you know, some animal. So I brought her in with me and in the makeup room, we Jamie was in there and and she had, of course, her Miss Piggy because she never went anywhere without Miss Piggy, her stuffed animal. And Barbara was saying to her, so Jamie, I hear you really like Kermit and Miss Piggy. And Jamie is like talking all about Kermit and Miss Piggy. And Barbara looks at me and says, we should have put her in the interview. Let's have her in the interview. And do you come in too, because I, I don't want to just, I don't know if I, I don't want to be on with just Jamie, a five-year-old. You you do it too. So it's time for the interview. And they have like a, a, a high bar top with bar stools. So they set up three bar stools. It's Barbara and me, Barbara and Jamie and me. <laughs> and behind the bar stool is Kermit, but it's also Bob McGrath with his hand. <laughs> and Jamie looks and Barbara looks at me with total fear in her eyes. Like, and we're like 15 seconds, 10 seconds. And she's sure that we're going to go on the air and Jamie's going to say, who's that man with his hand up Kermit's back? So my Jamie had an imaginary friend when she was a little girl. Her, his name was his or her name was Moogie. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we could come in from outside and say, mom, you've locked Moogie out. Open the door, you know, let Moogie in. Like she really had an imaginary friend. So I very quickly, with like five seconds to go, I looked at Jamie and said, Jamie, you know how you have your imaginary friend, Moogie? She said, yeah, mommy. And I said, that's Kermit's imaginary friend. And she's like, oh, two, one, you're on. And Barbara starts the interview and, you know, Kermit's right up there. Jamie went through the entire interview talking to Kermit. But there's something magical about the Muppets that, you know, there's a person down there, you're an adult, you see them, but you right. just magically, when they're on with you, you talk to that puppet. We get off, we go back to our seats and Barbara said, I almost had a heart attack when you did that. Like you actually brought it up. You actually brought her attention to him. I said, well, obviously she had already seen him. And I just was trying to ensure that she didn't like blow the entire Muppet magic and she was like, I guess you really have to know your kid. <laughs> so that's probably one of the best memories I have of Barbara and me on the air. Wow, what an incredible story and great memory to have for your daughter too. I wonder if she remembers that, like if she actually being so young. She's, but what an she's 42 memory. now. She's a, a, a health and wellness influencer on Instagram. 
mm -hmm. uh, Jamie Hess, and she's a, a, what do you call an accountability coach. I mean, she's all into health and wellness. I mean, she, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I'm super familiar with her. Yeah, yeah she, she's totally, she's NYC Fit Bam on Instagram. And she, I marvel at her. And I sometimes say I'm worried because you're just doing so much. I, aren't you overwhelmed? And she said, look who's talking. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm basically just like you, mom. I'm, and my life is like your life was when you had us and we were little and you were doing a national show and traveling around the world and you were doing a million other things at the same time. Um, so uh, it's wonderful because all three of my older daughters have been working with me in some fashion over the last 10 years on many of the different projects that I do that are health related. And it's so amazing and it's so wonderful to have your daughters buy into your mission in life, mm. your passion in life, which is the the um, the delivery of health information to help others, you know, try to have a healthier life, and they have totally bought into that, and I'm so grateful for that. I I can definitely relate to that as the She Rises Studios as a mother daughter duo. Oh, good. Okay, it's an incredible. What you just said, it is incredible when your children yep. uh, are a part of what you do. It's it's even legacy building. Yeah. And I know that we are, um, you are such an incredible leader by example. I, I could see why your daughter is doing what she's doing. So I know that we have to be mindful of time. And I just yeah. have one last teeny tiny question okay. before we go. And this question just comes um, from, you know, you have been such an open book all these years in every way, shape, or form. But what is something that maybe most don't know about Joan? You know, it's interesting because I think that's why I've, I've written 10 books. My last one was, why did I come into this room? A candid conversation about aging. Probably my most candid, certainly my funniest, because you can't talk about hot flashes and leaky bladders if you're not going to do it with a sense of humor. And sometimes my, my husband will sometimes look at me and like with that raised eyebrow, like, should you be talking about that? Should you be saying that? He walked through my office here one day and said, so what are you working on today? When I was working on that book and I said, I'm writing about leaky bladders. And he said, really? You're going to talk about leaky bladders? And I said, oh, the title of the chapter is I laugh so hard, tears roll down my leg. And he was like, like the are you sure you're not going to end your career? <laughs> but by being candid and honest, not to the point of oversharing. So people are mm -hmm. like enough already. We don't want to hear any more about your kids or whatever. I mean, it, you do have to walk a line a little bit, but I mean, I'm on Facebook all the time with my 80,000 BFFs who I really don't truly know most of them. Um, but I talk to them every day and <laughs> we converse and, and, um, by being totally candid, you break down this wall and you can accomplish things and you can inspire people and you can educate people and they'll listen to you. Whereas maybe they didn't listen to their doctor or some other expert because it's coming from me. So I kind of probably overshare. Um, I don't know what, what would they know? What would I I'm a good joke teller. And on the set of GMA, we used to always make up jokes and not jokes that we would ever have shared on the air. <laughs> it's because sometimes they would be about a story that was going on and it would have been way too irreverent and over the line to tell the joke. Um, but so the, 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 I'm very, very, um, I'm one take London. That's something because of doing live television, I now get hired for jobs all the time because producers know that they'll be in a studio for 45 minutes instead of three hours. Because once I get the script and I go over it and I'm on camera, I'm one take London. Um, and they say, it's just unbelievable. We don't need to do another take. And I said, do you think I ever got a second take on, on live television? Like, and here's a little unknown no. fact. In New York or in the, on the East Coast, sometimes things would happen something would be said or a tape wouldn't roll or something. So when it was bad enough, uh, 
we would stay in the studio. And when it became whatever time that mistake happened, like if it happened at 741, we would stay in the studio until 1041. And at 1041, they would click in and we would redo it live for the West Coast. So the West, the West Coast thought that Charlie and I, and before that, David and I, were so perfect. But people on the East Coast, they saw us with all of our gaffes and all of our mistakes. I love it. Full transparency. Yeah. Well, I, I'm so honored and that you took the time to spend this hour with me. Forever grateful. Uh, thank you so much, Joan, for, for just being that leader by example, for full transparency and just, just having this conversation with me. It, uh, it really, truly really is an honor. And you've made my day probably uh, the next, you know, 20 years. Um, I feel like we have so much more to look forward to from you. I'm excited um, yeah. for, for what's to come for you. And, and thank you so much for being with me today. My I hope you have an incredible 2023. And bye-bye to all of you watching. Bye, everyone. Thank you.